Tonight on NJTV News, their anticipated battle for the party nomination for governor never happened. Today, they were together in a common cause. A judge tells Senator Menendez forget about delaying or scheduling his criminal trial around critical votes in the Senate. Supporters of Obamacare keep up the pressure on lawmakers to keep the Affordable Care Act, even though efforts to repeal and replace it have failed. And police in Jersey City get body cameras thanks to a global giant and some new technology. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Michael Hill. Mary Alice Williams is off on this Friday. It took a few months, but the Democrat who's running for governor and the man who thought he'd be running for governor were together today. Ambassador Phil Murphy and Senate President Steve Sweeney, a joint appearance at a South Jersey employment center for the developmentally disabled. A cause close to Sweeney's heart. He talked to senior correspondent David Cruz about that and more. All right, Senate President Steve Sweeney is joining us. Senator, you were saying this is this is your place. This this is this is what really gets my juices flowing. When you go inside and you see these are individuals with disabilities that want to have the dignity and pride of having a job. And here you are, you're going to have the uh, man who you expect or hope will be the next governor of the state of New Jersey who you want to introduce to this or, or reintroduce. I, I want them to understand how important these, these places are, David. And, you know, and obviously I'm supporting Phil in a very strong way. I know that somewhere in your mind you're at an event like this and you're saying, you know, that could have, should have, been me. Do you still have those thoughts now? Nah, you know, David, politics are politics. You know, you don't get into this business and get your feelings hurt if you don't get your way. You know, I, th I, th I thought I was in a position, you know, so, do, so does Steve Falk and others. And you know, there can be one candidate from each side and there's going to be one winner. I'm very comfortable with Phil because he stands for a lot of things that I believe in. And I'm very excited to come back in, in the Senate. You know, I'm, I'm running again. I might not be running for governor, but I'm running for the Senate, and if, I, if I'm successful, which, you know, I never take anything for granted, uh, I intend to come back as Senate president, and it'll be a great opportunity to work with Phil. You are going to have, if, if things go your way, a Democratic governor. How's that going to be different? Sometimes, you know, having all everybody from the same party could lead to not so easy going. Listen, we, we, not, not everything was roses when we had John Cooper I was going to say. You know, we had struggles, but I really do believe Phil is willing to listen and understand that each branch is, is there are individual and they have priorities too. And what we want to do is meet with Phil, line up the priorities. Like the, we already agree on several things, equal pay, you know, expanding paid family leave, the millionaire's tax. Um, uh, what, what else do we have? Uh, sick leave. There's there's a whole host of things that we already agree I'm going to say a 2% cap on salary arbitration. Well, listen, we're, we got a study coming back, you know, on that, and then we'll make a decision when the administration, when the new administrations come in. We want to review what the study says. You know, I'm the one that sponsored the bill, you know, David, and we, we did it on purpose that it would sunset, but it wouldn't sunset until the report came back. Is there not sufficient evidence out there in your mind to suggest I'm, that it's working? I'm not saying it's not working. Yeah. What I'm saying is it sunsets December, I guess, 31st. So we have time. You know, neither, ha neither house is really coming back. We need to work together, and we're going to work with the next administration and, and see, w see where we go with it. Because the Republican running for governor says keep it in place, and you guys are just I'm hemming and hawing because I'm not the unions. Hawing. No, I'm not him, uh, David, of all people. <laughs> you know, look, you, you, I got a million-dollar campaign against me yeah. uh, from, from one union. You know, it's, I, I've never backed down for what I believe in. We want to follow through with the legislation the way it was written. He's got the NJEA in his corner anyway, that maybe with all of you in the same room again, you'll start to be more friendly? 
With who? The NJEA, particularly, because well, they're supporting the, the listen, Phil Murphy. I'm, I'm happy that I, I want everyone to support Phil Murphy. So I'm, I'm happy that everyone support him. Clearly, they're not supporting me, but you know something? I'm being supported by the largest teachers union in the country, the AFT. Why we're having this fight, we're having it, but in my mind, it doesn't matter. All right, Senate President Steve Sweeney, thanks a lot. Have a great nice. weekend. Thank you, David. David Cruz reporting there. The effort to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act has failed a few times in recent months, but supporters of Obamacare say that's no reason to rest. They know how much some lawmakers and the White House want to kill it. Andrew Smirks has the story. A campaign-style bus that's touring the country to rally support for the Affordable Care Act pulled into West Orange Friday, one day after the Trump administration announced it was cutting the advertising budget for the ACA by 90 percent. It's a clear attempt to sabotage America's health care system. Uh, and, you know, we all know what it's going to do, right? It's going to jack up premiums. The bus tour has been through about 30 states. A coalition of progressive groups, including abortion rights activists, have banded together to support the tour's mission. It's really to um, shine a spotlight on individuals across the country who both have benefited from the Affordable Care Act and have so much to lose if it goes away. Though somewhat gimmicky, the bus does draw attention. Members of the Drive for Our Lives group record stories of people who claim Obamacare saved them. Ali Chandra's son was born with extensive birth defects. Our lives were falling apart, and so we turned to Medicaid. I will never, ever forget the feeling of relief that I felt sitting across the desk from that woman in that office and realizing that because of the ACA, because of the Medicaid expansion here in New Jersey, there was a safety net. We were able to purchase a plan through United Healthcare because of the marketplace. They covered the surgeries to remove the tumor in my chest wall as well as my ovaries, along with 16 rounds of chemo and 15 rounds of radiation. The group uses the opportunity to target opponents of the ACA. In this case, Congressman Rodney Freelandheisen, who is one of two New Jersey Republicans to vote to repeal the law. The congressman didn't return our calls for comment, but in May, he told the Morristown Patch, quote, Obamacare is failing to make health care affordable for New Jersey families facing skyrocketing premiums, soaring deductibles, and fewer choices. But Assemblywoman Myla J.C. says parts of the ACA, specifically expanding Medicaid, have bipartisan support in the state. Those of us here in the New Jersey legislature do support health care for all. We were able to reach across the aisle and get some of our colleagues to pressure the governor to expand Medicaid services. From here, the bus goes to New York City, Philadelphia, and then Washington, in time for when Congress comes back into session. In West Orange, Andrew Schmertz, NJTV News. The governor targets Big Pharma, turning to how now in the state of New Jersey business. Rhonda Schaffler is standing by. Rhonda, the governor is trying to end a long-held practice? That's right, Michael. Governor Christie has another plan of attack in his war against opiate abuse. Citing the drug crisis as justification, the governor is proposing new rules that would crack down on the practice of pharmaceutical companies giving payments to doctors. Drug and device makers would be prohibited from providing physicians with things like expensive meals, consulting work, and excessive pay for speaking engagements. Federal data finds drug companies gave $69 million to state doctors in 2016, a 17% increase over the prior year. A hearing on this proposed rule is set for next month. The wave of hospital mergers continues in New Jersey. Cooper University Healthcare is acquiring three Catholic hospitals from the Trinity Health System. When that merger is complete, Cooper University will become the fourth largest health system in New Jersey. NJ Transit is the subject of an investigation by the U.S. Labor Department for alleged abuse of the Family Medical Leave Act by its employees. That law provides certain workers with unpaid medical and family leave and also offers job protection. At NJ Transit, some 1,500 employees, or 10 percent of the entire workforce, were approved for unpaid leave as of the middle of May. This is according to an internal NJ Transit audit. The transit agency did not comment on the specifics of the federal probe. 
An update to our story on gas prices yesterday. If you're heading out for the holiday weekend, bring extra cash. Prices at the pump rose 7 cents a gallon just since yesterday. The Oil Price Information Service today projected prices could rise to as high as $2.75 a gallon in New Jersey due to Hurricane Harvey. If you're a fan of Atlantic City's Hard Rock Cafe, better get there before the end of this month. The Hard Rock will shut down its boardwalk location on September 30th. Eventually, it will be relocated into the former Trump Taj Mahal Casino, which the Hard Rock purchased and plans to reopen, but not until next summer. Economic news today, a not as rosy view of the economy from the federal government, which said the economy added 156,000 jobs in August. That's less than what Roseland-based ADP reported two days ago. On Wall Street, stocks rose, the Dow up more than 39 points. And that's a look at our top business stories. Support for the Business Report is provided by SJ Magazine, the heart and soul of South Jersey. Online at sjmagazine.net. Amtrak says it's finished its summer track project a day before the September 1st deadline. Workers rebuilt track junctions, switches, and crossovers between New York Penn Station and the Hudson River tunnels. It cost 30 to 40 million dollars. It means Amtrak and NJ Transit can go back to regular schedules next Tuesday. For 44 days, NJ Transit diverted Morris and Essex lines to Hoboken Terminal instead of Penn Station to allow Amtrak to do the work on a faster basis. A federal judge has rejected Senator Bob Menendez's request to schedule his bribery trial around critical votes in Washington. Judge William Wall says defense attorneys are trying to impress jurors with the public importance of the senator and his duties. But Wall says he will not, quote, serve as concierge to any party or lawyer. Menendez goes on trial next Wednesday but does not have to be physically there. The judge already has agreed to accommodate the senator by holding trial from 9.30 to 2.30. New Jersey is trying to change the way its residents spend their last days, days that can be the most expensive because of care that's considered unnecessary, delivered in hospitals as opposed to hospice. To what I call the greatest airport on the planet, because it's a place for, for families to land to their reality of what's coming. It's like a long runway. You land and you come and the place for the, the patient to fly off into the sky. With poetry and passion, Ian Kahn, the actor who plays George Washington in the AMC series Washington Spies, praised Villa Marie Claire for caring for his mother-in-law as her life was coming to an end. Villa Marie Claire is considered New Jersey's only residential hospice, the place where those with days, sometimes just hours, left to live. It's not about it's a death with dignity. I mean, that's part of it. But it's about living those last days. It's about life. Holy Name Medical Center owns Villa Marie. Its CEO says in America right now, hospitals provide expensive end-of-life care at rates way above the cost of hospice care. And New Jersey tops the list for such Medicare spending. At a time when we're all concerned about the rising escalation of health care costs, most of it is done in the last six months of life. And most of it is futile. But now, New Jersey, after a contentious budget cycle and with the governor's approval, has given $5 million to Holy Name for Villa Marie to create a model for end-of-life care. This could have been derailed a thousand ways, and it should have been, because that's what normally happens in politics. And when you have the, the, the less and less money, these are the things that get cut. But I will tell you, Paul, very, very persuasive. I never thought in all the years I've been in the legislature, um, that I would spend so many weeks and months talking about end-of-life care um, because I had to educate and inform a lot of folks what this facility was really about because it is sort of a subject and topic that a lot of us don't want to have a discussion about. This is a game-changer for us. At Villa Marie, families can stay for free, cook their own meals, children can swim and play, and even after a loved one has passed, Families can get 13 months of free therapy. The hope here is the model created for end-of-life care here will go beyond Bergen County, beyond New Jersey, and set the standard for America and beyond. The hospice's medical director says he knows the agony of the end. He lost his wife to cancer. So this 
wonderful grant is such an opportunity for us to expand our scope, expand our vision, get our message out even further, provide to an even broader base of people, and hopefully get people here sooner so that we can do more for them, so the patient can benefit from being here as much as their families can. This place is the future. It is kindness. It is love. Help for Houston and the Gulf Coast. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, TNIC, Holy Name Medical Center, answering the call to help fellow hospitals after Hurricane Harvey. Holy Name hosted a blood drive and collected more than 100 units to ship off to the Gulf Coast, even though New Jersey has a shortage of its own. Holy Name says this is an opportunity to make a powerful contribution and to give back after getting help during Superstorm Sandy nearly five years ago. The hospital's chief of infectious disease also is warning folks headed to Houston. He's advising volunteers to protect themselves against mosquito bites and infections by using DEET, wearing gloves, and making sure their vaccinations are in order before going. Next to New Brunswick, move-in day for Rutgers Honors College freshmen. About 500 of them, many with their parents and friends in tow, brought some belongings to campus. Some Honors College upperclassmen and volunteers from the Residence Life move-in team did some heavy lifting as well. The Honors students will live alongside some faculty and the academic dean. The State University opened the Honors College three years ago at a cost of nearly $85 million. It's for the school's best and brightest from several academic fields. Finally, to Jersey City. Three years ago today, a gunshot wounded Brianna Bay's right foot. She was walking home to Salem Lafayette Public Housing. The former high school basketball player of the year said the shooting was a game changer. It forced her to miss her sophomore year of college. She finished, though, at Stetson University in Florida. Jersey City has honored her because Bay spends much of her time inspiring kids with her story, hoping they can avoid and escape the violence of what she calls the gun zone. And what a story she has to share. She may be the first woman from a public school in Jersey City to land on a professional basketball team. Bay's bound for Ireland after signing a contract with the Brunel Ladies Basketball Club. And that's our Garden State Express for this Friday, September 1st, 2017. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. School districts across the state have tested for lead in their water, but often accessing the results is a challenge. Brianna Venosi finds out what's being done from Chris Stern, the Policy and Water Managing Director of NJ Future. So, Chris, this is actually the first time statewide data has been compiled like this. What are we seeing? How widespread is the issue of lead in our drinking water? Um, what we found is that lead is pervasive in drinking water in schools across New Jersey in schools small and large in every county of the state. Um, we found rural communities like High Point in Sussex County, suburban towns like Berkeley Heights. But how many districts and how many schools is this actually, uh, are we seeing where these levels are reportedly higher? Unfortunately, we can't give you accurate data because the data that we received from the Department of Education was incomplete for a number of reasons. But what we do know is that over 300 schools have at least one drinking water outlet that's testing above um, federal levels for lead in drinking water. Do, does the data show where that uh, water outlet is? So, I mean, if I'm a parent and we're about to go back to school right now, are we talking about water fountains? Does the data differentiate if this is a sink in a room that's never used or a water fountain where my child is drinking from daily? That's a really good question. And um, we are encouraging all parents to check out their school district's website and look for the lead testing results. The um, Districts were required to identify which schools had problem outlets and to describe those outlets. And we found, you know, kind of a mixed bag. Um, they were only supposed to require uh, outlets that are used to prepare food in cafeterias and drinking fountains that kids are using. But we did see some reports that included things like janitor sinks. Um, but if there's any question, parents can go directly to school districts to get the, you know, more precise data. Why don't we have all of that data in? Uh, 
as it's supposed to be reported. There was a deadline this July. Um, they're only supposed to report it when, when the, the levels are elevated? That's right. So the regulations which the Board of Education adopted, and I should note that New Jersey is one of just a handful of states that are requiring this lead, test, lead testing. Right. Governor Christie put this into place in 2016, of course, after Flint, Michigan erupted across the nation. That's right. And we're really glad that he did that. Um, so the regulations are limited, though. They're really a first step. So what we've seen and what the regulations require is that school districts that are testing, all school districts have to test, all districts have to report on the district website, but only districts with positive results have to send those res res reports into the Department of Education. New Jersey Future then reached out to the Department of Education and they indicated that they wouldn't be compiling results statewide. So we, OPRAD, using the Open Public Records Act, requested those reports and we got what they sent us. Um, we don't know, so we only got reports where there were positive right, lead we don't levels. Know where and what we didn't get, we don't know what that means. We don't know if those are districts that were doing testing sure. and reporting locally but didn't send it in. And we know that some cities were doing that, like Camden and Atlantic City Places and Places where this has been a problem that we've known about. What does the report recommend we do from here? Well, it recommends a bunch of things. Um, First of all, we um, really want to see better uh, data collection. We would like in this 21st century to see the Department of Education setting up an electronic portal so that school districts can send in data to fields that are well defined so we can know exactly which kinds of outlets, for example, are exhibiting lead and the results can be tallied easily. We also want to see those reports shared with the public. We want the state to be able to get its arms around the extent of the problem so that we understand what the economics are for addressing it. And so certainly then parents can go and check um, and it would encourage them to do so. Absolutely. They, there would be one easy spot for them to find results. Um, and you know, there's also this issue where um, some cities may need help uh, to do long-term remediation. You know, Smaller districts, districts with a lot of resources, can probably replace the drinking fountains and interior pipes um, themselves. But we know that districts like Camden and Newark are facing some tough challenges. Well, we'll be keeping an eye on it, and we know that your organization will be as well. Chris Sturm, thank you so much for coming in. Sure. Thank you for having me. Police officers in Jersey City are wearing body cameras, but they're not like the ones Newark police have, and they don't cost the same. Leah Mishkin shows us the new technology from a global giant. Cell phone video out of Jersey City made headlines a few months ago when a police chase ended with this scene. Cars on fire and what appears to be officers kicking a man on the ground. But what officials later confirmed was that the man was not the suspect they were after. It was apparently an innocent person. At the time, Jersey City's mayor said the cops responsible should be fired. They fired their weapons from their car uh, at another moving vehicle. Uh, there are issues with that. Um, there are issues with how they continued the chase after additional information. And then there's issues around um, obviously what you saw in the video. At the same time, the police union criticized those comments, saying the mayor rushed to judgment. The question is, what would have happened if the officers were also recording? Would the truth never be questioned in these situations, if not just a glimpse, but an entire picture from start to finish was on camera? It's a conversation that was started a few years ago in Jersey City. They awarded a $1.2 million contract to Pennsylvania-based company MVC for 1,200 body cameras. But we're told the first set of cameras the city received allegedly didn't work properly, and the city cut ties with the company. Any money we had spent, which was not the whole $1.2 million, we spent money on the physical servers, which we were able to repurpose to this project. So we protected ourselves. That project, Jersey City Public Safety Director James Shea is referring to, is a new partnership with Google. It's an app called Copcast. It's a magnet that clips right into, um, right into the case. 
The app allows cell phones to be transformed into body cameras, and Jersey City, we're told, is the first in the nation to test the technology. It works. It gets the job done. It mounts it pretty securely, I mean, so it works. Jersey City Patrol Officer Amir Alatik has been testing this body camera for about three months. We're doing a pilot program with the city for uh, body cameras for police officers, uh -huh. and we just stop into local businesses, check in, make sure everything's okay. The first testing stage has been completed, and the technology is expected to now be rolled out to close to 200 Jersey City police officers. I honestly think it's important for the safety of any person involved in the whole situation, for the officer and, you know, the person that they're dealing with. But going through the process of equipping all the officers with these body cameras has started a new conversation. It brings privacy issues. People have a right not to be videoed at certain times. For instance, juveniles have a right to have their identity protected. People uh, receiving medical treatment have, there are HIPAA laws that guarantee their privacy. Uh, certain victims, for instance, victims of uh, what we call special victims, victims of sexual crimes, have a right to have their privacy protected. It's a topic he says police departments across the country are facing. We asked the director what is the answer for Jersey City. Our default is going to be that the officer chooses when to put it on and not and that the officer is trained in those policies so they know who we need them, whose privacy we need them to protect. What does officer Amir al think? For the most part we do our jobs expecting that we're recorded all the time anyway. Um, so, I mean, as long as you do the right thing, you, you, you do your, uh, your job the way you should and you um, address the situations that are supposed to be addressed at every call that you respond to, um, you, have, you don't really have anything to worry about. And this is just one more reference point um, in case anything uh, should come up. In Jersey City, Leia Mishkin, NJTV News. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Michael Hill. For all of us here, thank you for watching and have a great holiday weekend. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. I, th I thought I was in the...